we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. It's a two o'clock block today. We're talking about the military in Hawaii, more specifically. We're talking about the Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard, and we're talking about Par Hawaii, Par Pacific. Uh, and we're joined by Captain uh, Greg Burton of the uh, Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard. He's a commander there. And Mark DeWilliger, he's with Par Hawaii, and he sells oil. Am I right, you guys? Did I get it right? <laughs> yeah, good afternoon, good, Jay. Jay. Thanks for having us. Yeah, good Captain, afternoon, Jay. Why, why don't you tell us what it's like to be the commander of the Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard? It is a big undertaking enterprise, isn't it? Hey, it is a big enterprise. And, uh, you know, it's referred to as the crown jewel in the Pacific between the West Coast of, of America and the Far East. Um, but that crown jewel really goes to not not the facilities and the dry docks, but it goes to the, the talented folks that, that work here. Uh, and there's over, if you include contractors, over 7,100 folks that work here. Uh, those are the crown jewel uh, that I would refer to surrounded by the shipyard. Uh, there's all kinds of things going on. Usually our, our dry docks are full. We're the busiest uh, fast attack home port in the Navy with approximately 16 uh, home ported ships here. And we have responsibility for four home ported ships in Guam as well. Uh, so a lot of stuff going on on the submarine front. And we also have uh, 10 surface ships home ported here uh, that we uh, contract out maintenance uh, to do maintenance on those. So, you know, our mission is to deliver uh, ships that are fit to fight back to the fleet. And we do that with a, a, a skilled, talented workforce on a daily basis. Uh, concerned about the workforce, concerned about safety. It's an industrial environment. We're the largest industrial employer in Hawaii. Uh, and it's quite a journey every day. I love coming to work. I love everything about the shipyard. You like the dry docks. You have a thing with dry docks. Can you talk about why? Uh, I, I mean, if you've ever been to a shipyard and you've looked into a dry dock and seen a, a ship, uh, you know, a large ship, submarine ship out of the water on on tiny blocks uh, it's really an engineering marvel and it gives us an opportunity to get in there and, and do maintenance uh, where we wouldn't otherwise be able to do you know pier side you know painting and preservation and working on hole and backup valves and all those kind of things uh, it's just a, a great opportunity you see some highly skilled technicians doing just amazing work with big huge pieces of equipment and machinery so uh, it's just a, a great place to come so just a question that comes to mind, can you put a carrier in one of those dry docks? Um, yes, we can. We can, uh, we can fit a, a Nimitz-class carrier in our largest dry dock, uh, dry dock four, uh, though the Navy has no plans to do any carrier work uh, here in Hawaii. Um, by dimensions, uh, we can fit the carrier. Uh, we don't have the right utilities lineup uh, to service a carrier, uh, but by dimensions, we could dry, uh, dry dock a carrier here in Pearl Harbor. It must be, uh, are you an engineer? I, uh, you told me before uh, that you were a submariner and for a while you were in the army, but are you an engineer? Um, I do have uh, engineering degrees um, and I've worked in the, the Naval Nuclear Power uh, Program in the Navy uh, for you know almost 34 years now. Um, so I, I have uh, mechanical and electrical engineering degrees and I worked nuclear power in the Navy uh, for 34 years. So um, you know, I'm a Naval officer, so you know, being a, a leader comes first, uh, but I do have uh, much engineering experience. You have to be a leader if you're commanding 7,100 <laughs> people. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> so are you academy? I am not. I, I enlisted as a machinist mate in the Navy and then uh, applied for an officer program, got one, and went right back in the nuclear program after graduating from the University of New Mexico and then uh, spent my time as an officer operating submarines and then uh, wedged my way into the engineering duty officer community, uh, which that community is responsible for building ships, uh, maintaining ships, modernizing ships, and then decommissioning those ships at the end, cradle to grave. Um, and I found my niche in the shipyard part of that enterprise. Yeah, that's great. Well, I love asking, you know, military officers about their careers and their histories and how they and how they have, have gone through the system, so to speak. And I really uh, enjoy this conversation. So, Mark, you have some, aside from being an executive with, uh, with PAR, um, you have some military experience too. Can you talk about it? 
I did, yeah, Jay. Um, so I was a an Army logistics officer for 12 years here. Uh, my last duty station was out here in Hawaii. I uh, ended up at Fort Shafter uh, up at the uh, U.S. Army Pacific. Uh, so background was, you know, 12 years as a logistics officer, so doing uh, anything from beams to bullets to, you know, fuel, pipelines, um, you know, other operations like that. Did you have a good time? Oh, I loved it. It was great. Um, you know, just after 12 years, I decided uh, it was time to start a family. And, uh, you know, my wife and I decided it was time to transition out and uh, then joined the civilian sector. And uh, that took us back to the mainland for about four years and then uh, had the opportunity to, to come back out here to Hawaii and join the, the PAR team. And that's where it brought me here today. So don't regret yeah. any of it. Honestly, now, Mark, are there mornings where you wake up and you look out the window and say, gee, I, I would be retired by now. <laughs> I could have stayed in. Ever have those, those reminiscent thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> Every once in a while you have that. But you know what? Hey, at the end of the day, I'm back here in Hawaii and uh, enjoying life. So it's a, it's a tough. It's, a, it's hard to look back in the rearview mirror, right? Yeah, well, yeah, but sometimes it happens, you know, uh, uh, involuntarily, you know, I can tell you what happens to me. That's why I ask you. So anyway, so uh, tell us about PAR. What is PAR? What are you doing for PAR? Uh, so, you know, PAR Pacific uh, is our parent company, and we have uh, essentially four oil refineries, uh, one out in uh, Newcastle, Wyoming, one up in Tacoma, Washington, uh, and then we have two out here uh, on the west side of Oahu, um, both out in the Campbell Industrial Park. Um, on top of the, the oil refineries, we also have uh, a fairly large logistics hub. We have a pipeline here uh, on Oahu, um, and we have several terminals, one in uh, Kauai, uh, two on the Big Island, and one in Maui. Um, you know, and through that, we, we support a uh, retail organization here in Hawaii, as well as out in Spokane, uh, Washington. And, you know, Glad that I could be part of the show today and partnered with the military because they are one of our biggest clients. Uh, and, you know, we, we service and support them um, with different grades of fuel that we produce right here on Oahu. That includes aviation right fuel? Right here in Oahu, I should say. It does, yeah. So we provide, uh, we provide the military with um, what we refer to as JAA or J their jet fuel, uh, as well as F-76, which I believe is the, uh, the Navy's kind of equivalent to diesel. Okay, uh, that is that. Those are bunkers. Is that what they call a bunker? Yeah, uh, the different bunker fuel, sure. And then at one point, uh, we did support them with uh, JP five as well, which is um, kind of a little uh, a different grade of, of jet fuel that they use for the uh, the aviation on the uh, the Navy ships. You do any refining anymore? We do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we have two we have two refineries out here on the west side. Um, one of them is currently. Uh, reduced in uh, capacity basically because of COVID and the, uh, the lesson in the demand for, uh, for product right now. Uh, but the other one, uh, which we refer to as Par East, even though it's out here on the west side of the island, um, it's still uh, up in, in full operation and uh, we still refine fuel uh, you know, on a daily basis. It's interesting because you, you know, it's a metric for how well the economy is doing. If you're, if you're selling a lot of fuel, <laughs> the economy is humming right along. If Absolutely. you're not, it means people are staying home and not doing much. You know. Certainly. Yeah. And, you know, COVID has, has definitely put an impact. I mean, obviously uh, on the entire economy of Hawaii, and we certainly see that in the, the fuel market, um, you know, with, with the lower demand, people not commuting as much, you see it at the gas pump. Uh, and certainly uh, with airlines not flying nearly as frequently as they, they were in the past, uh, we saw, you know, a significant decrease in the, the jet fuel demand. So, Captain, you really need to know, Mark. Do you know, Mark? Do you deal with him? Do you pick up the phone and say hi? Do you have Zoom meetings? Uh, I, I don't. <laughs> he sounds like a great guy, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, what is, it, what is it with fuel for you at the Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard? I mean, I can imagine a lot of people working on ships there, but you're, you don't have a lot of vehicles, do you, or do you? Um, no, but I, I would say, um, you know, the, the base, um, really joint base Pearl Harbor Hickam coordinates all of the fuel uh, for the surface ships. And then uh, the, the submarines 
um, except for some some backup diesel generator power, um, really run on nuclear fuel. So um, I don't have that much interaction with um, you know the kind of fuel that that Mark's in the business of selling. Okay, so you know the bottom line of our program today, in fact, the title of it is how um, your respective organizations demonstrate um, how the effect, the economic effect of the military on the uh, economics of Hawaii. Uh, so, uh, Captain, can you, can you address that? How do you feel the shipyard particularly? And I suppose we can call, call, talk about the base too in general. Um, how does it affect uh, the, um, and I think we should also, we should also talk about the history of it. You know, we talked before the show about how, how many, you know, it's, uh, well, gosh, it's 170 years ago, uh, the Navy was at Pearl Harbor. That's a long time. Um, and so you are integrated, but how? How do we how do we find indicia of that today? Yeah, this this uh, whole area of the Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam really are our sacred lands, uh, Pu'u Loa, of of Pearl Harbor. Um, the 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 shipyard was was authorized by Congress back in 1908, uh, where we started construction of our first dry dock, which finished in 1919, um, and if uh, last year in 2019, we had the 100 year anniversary of Dry Dock One. Um, we worked with the Hawaiian delegation and uh, we, we gave Dry Dock One a name, um, Keao Na Mano, uh, which means the realm of the sharks. And so we, we felt a uh, great connection there um, and that, that history continues to grow. Uh, we've we've done uh, you know great things in the shipyard over the years. Uh, many folks remember um, the USS Yorktown uh, after the bombing in Pearl Harbor um, with initial estimates of, of three months from the shipyard. Uh, we had just broken the Japanese code in the bottom of building one here uh, right on shipyard property. Uh, that's where the code breakers were. Uh, so another piece of history that is tied directly to the shipyard. Um, Admiral Nimitz came down and said, you, you have three days to turn that, that ship around. Um, and, and the shipyard went to, went to work on it, um, actually caused brownouts on the island so we could uh, supply enough power to all the welding that was going on. Um, and that, that ship uh, turned around in three days, uh, got out of dock, and was pivotal in, uh, in uh, the Battle of Midway and the turning of the tide of, of World War II in the Pacific. Wow. Wow. Um, so, and that history continues now. We've, you know, we've been working on Los Angeles class submarines, uh, destroyers, cruisers, and now the new Virginia class submarines that that have have been uh, coming in to replace the, uh, the the Los Angeles class submarines that are being inactivated at the end of their service life. Um, and we've been uh, um, learning how to do maintenance on on those new submarines, and we've been doing really well. Uh, where the Virginia class center of excellence is designated by our, our parent command. Uh, so a lot of really great things uh, going on um, in the shipyard and not just today, but through that history uh, from 1908 uh, to today. But it, when you talk about economic impact, you know, if I could pull back a little bit and just, just talk about some, some of the numbers, you know, that are, are beyond the shipyard, but, um, I, I think I can share some recent numbers with you for uh, defense spending um, in, on the island. Um, well, I, in Hawaii, uh, defense spending is, has been, you know, recently uh, in, in recent years, about $7.2 billion uh, per year uh, to the Hawaii state economy. Uh, $4.9 billion of that uh, goes directly to payroll. Uh, so, you know, local uh, island paychecks. About 2.3 billion of that in contracts, um, and so, you know, 49,000 local jobs uh, with the payroll, and about 30,000 uh, jobs through federal contracts. Uh, so, really, a, a huge influx uh, from defense spending. When you bring that down uh, to the Navy, um, about 57.8 percent of that 2.3 billion in contract spending. Uh, stays local in Hawaii. Um, and then when you bring it down uh, to the shipyard, you know, I mentioned earlier that we, we take in about a billion dollars every year. And of that billion dollars, uh, about 731 million goes directly to paychecks. Um, we also have a, a big impact with uh, the, the, con the local con the contractor base that works on our surface ships. 
And we, we let uh, anywhere from 150 to $250 million a year uh, that goes to local contracts, local contractors to work on, on surface ships. So, um, you know, that's a, a very significant impact. Uh, during, during COVID, um, a lot of that work has continued. We're, we're up around 91, 92% of full capacity, uh, even during COVID. Uh, we're designated mission essential, and we have a critical national security mission to carry out in the shipyard, yeah. and that has largely been able to continue. So, you know, you talk to folks that are working in the shipyard and, and multi-generational folks, um, they understand the critical nature of this work, uh, and they understand why it's important to come to work uh, and and do the welding and do the pipe fitting and the ship fitting and everything else that has to go on to deliver these ships back to the fleet. Uh, even amidst this uh, this battle against the unseen enemy, <laughs> COVID-19, uh, but that's some of the some of the impact uh, that Pearl Harbor brings to the local economy. How do you cope with uh, COVID? I mean, um, what special arrangements have you made? I, I assume masks and distancing, but have you uh, put partitions in? Have you changed work schedules? What have you done to minimize the risk to you know the people who work at the shipyard? Uh, good question. Uh, we've we've done a little bit of all of what you uh, just talked about. You know, we I encourage people to do what, what I call take five, and it starts with a, a a personal screening. You know, at home before you come to work. You know, what's my temperature? Do I have any flu-like symptoms? You know, so that's where it starts. You know, if you feel any flu-like symptoms, don't even come into the shipyard, right? And then uh, once you come into the shipyard, I ask them to wear their mask. Uh, I'm not wearing a mask right now, but I'm I'm isolated in my office and the door shut. Um, I do have my mask right here. <laughs> okay. Yeah, um, right. But but wearing masks are important. Um, that physical distancing is important. Uh, we also um, do frequent hand washing. Uh, we we uh, clean uh, our high touch areas and high traffic areas uh, three times a shift, uh, and these are all you know in our policies and protocols. Um, we've got, uh, you know, documentation to, to show that we're doing that. Um, so there, there's a lot of things uh, that, that we've done in the shipyard. We, we've also learned, you know, when, when supplies were limited, uh, we also made almost uh, 30,000 face masks so that every employee here could have five masks. Uh, we developed uh, using the, the Center for Disease Control formula, we made our own, you know, hand sanitizer solution. And, and we distributed that hand sanitizer solution to other activities uh, so they could have some when, when uh, we were on kind of a short supply here on the island. Uh, so we have, we have done that. Uh, we have tried to spread um, our, our day shift across our second and third shift uh, so that we could minimize the footprint on any given shift um, so that we could increase that physical distance and minimize the risk uh, to our employees. We've also encouraged our employees to, to telework when they can. Um, and, and teleworking um, that, that contributes to the mission and is in accordance with their you know, position description, you know, those things that they're getting paid to do. It's not just you know, go home and telework. Um, we, we actually have a, a critical mission to accomplish here. And, and when we can support that teleworking, we're, we're encouraging our folks to telework. So, I mean, that kind of paints the, the picture of, of how we're dealing with COVID. We actually have a, a very robust program. Um, you know, we do also have a, a temperature screening uh, for folks coming in uh, at random locations, uh, just to continue to remind folks that, you know, we, hey, we've got to We've got to wear the mask, physical distance, um, consider uh, others um, so that we can continue this critical mission here in the shipyard. Wow, <clears throat> that's a lot of things. Have you been successful? I mean, have, have there been cases? Uh, have, have you had uh, issues where people um, didn't follow the rules or even did follow the rules and wound up getting sick on the outside? We've, I mean, we've, um, we've certainly had uh, our, our cases uh, in the, sh in the shipyard um, for, for operational security reasons and for privacy reasons, I can't give you any, any numbers. Um, the, the numbers in the shipyard have remained low. Uh, we, we had uh, a few cases early on uh, as, as did the island. And then we had that, that long, 
you know, not much was happening on the island. And then we had this second phase, you know, where we had a, a spike in the island and then we did have increased numbers uh, in the shipyard. But we're, we've are we been able to maintain, uh, like I said, about 91, 92% full capacity uh, here in the shipyard. Um, we've, we've taken some impacts with COVID, but we're still able to um, continue the mission and, and deliver uh, back to the fleet. Uh, to the extent you can discuss it, I'd be interested in knowing, you know, the um, the um, the trends. <clears throat> are you you are you have do you have substantially more people uh, under your command now, or less than you did, you know, a few years ago? Uh, do you have substantially more mm, funding than you did? I mean, how is that how is that moving up or down or or sideways? Um, in the in the shipyard, we've been uh, consistently moving up. So our, our workload has moved up. Um, our, the number of employees that we've hired have, have moved up. Um, five, six years ago, uh, we were right around 4,000. And now we're right around 6,500, 6,600 total. Um, so we, we are moving up. Um, we're, we're gonna be at this level uh, for, the, for the next foreseeable future. Uh, we do see our workload continue to increase. Um, and so, you know, the way that we're going to get there is, is uh, with innovation and, um, you know, uh, increasing our productive capacity uh, to, to, to do more with the, the number of employees that we have now. And you're going to stay here. I mean, you mentioned, for example, that you, you cover ships out of Guam and I suppose other areas, all areas in, in uh, you know, Western Pacific, Indo-Pacific, if you will. Um, <clears throat> but our, uh, I assume that this is going, at least as we know today, this is going to remain the home base shipyard for the whole area. And there's, there's no competitive shipyard elsewhere uh, within the American uh, fleet. Right? Well, we have, I mean, we have four public shipyards and, um, you know, two West Coast shipyards, uh, the, the Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard being one of those West Coast shipyards, the other shipyard being Pearl uh, Puget Sound Naval Shipyard in Bremerton, Washington. Um, all, all of us um, really every year, uh, look at our workload, you know, down um, the fiscal or the future year's defense plan, you know, per the government lineup. Um, and, and we uh, level load our shipyards um, accordingly. Um, so there's a lot of puts and takes uh, with, with the shipyards to make sure we've got a pretty level loaded uh, workload through, you know, through the out years. Um, so, um, but I mean, if you're talking about, I mean, we are the, you know, we are the shipyard between the, the West Coast and the Far East, um, and there's really no no competition there. Uh, yeah. But we've we've we see a continued increasing workload just based on uh, you know the new Virginia class submarines coming in um, with the the components of surface ship maintenance that we take care of as well. Well, that's good for Pearl Harbor and it's good for Hawaii. It absolutely uh, is. Mark, I you know I was asking the captain all these questions because I I wanted to sort of interest you in in another career, uh, possibly. <laughs> You could join the Navy now. It wouldn't be too late. Uh, I can put you guys together. Maybe you can have a conversation about it. Yeah, yeah that's great. Hey, you know, Captain, I'll get your number after this. We'll see if you can. <laughs> hey, we, we, uh, we have over a thousand engineers employed at the shipyard. I mean, it's uh, quite a think tank. <laughs> you have some of our graduates from Think Tech Hawaii over there, too. <laughs> Full disclosure. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, we, I think we have two of yours. So thank you. <laughs> so, Mark, uh, you know, tell me how you know, PAR Pacific and, you know, your operations uh, affect the state in general. And, and I suppose the question is, that there's a triangular thing happening here. Uh, it's PAR, it's the Navy, in fact, the whole military, and it's the, you know, the civilian community. Can you try to tell me, you know, how you affect both of those other, other areas? Yeah, certainly, Jay. I mean, um, so, you know, part, we are the, uh, the only refining assets out here uh, on the island. So when you look at, um, you know, the refined product, the gas stations or the, the jet fuel at the, air, uh, at the airport, or the military, you know, we're, we are the ones producing it here on the island. Um, and so with that being said, you know, it's certainly tied to the economy when it goes up, you know, things are great. When, it, when the demand goes down, things uh, tend to trend downward. And, um, you know, our relationship with the military is key in that as well. Um, you know, I spoke earlier, we provide them with uh, jet fuel as well as some Navy diesel. Um, but, you know, there's other programs that we have been partnering and working with the, the military and particularly the Navy, um, doing different proof, 
proofs of concept. Um, you know, as the captain mentioned, you know, Hawaii is certainly a strategic location out here in the Pacific, uh, where that last stop between the West Coast and, and the Far East, right? Um, so with that, uh, fuel reserves are certainly uh, kind of, they're critical, not just for, um, you know, the, the economy of the islands and, uh, you know, the civilian population, but certainly from a strategic defense standpoint. Um, and so in that, you know, we've been partnering with the military to come up with different alternatives and options uh, for them um, to provide to provide fuel. So one of those, uh, you know, we, we support them and provide fuel up to uh, Red Hill, which is, you know, uh, fuel storage facility. Uh, and in that, you know, they utilize our pipeline and we, we push them product. Uh, one of those uh, proofs of concept we did was uh, a few years back in 2017, where we did the reverse to see um, if we could actually receive fuel from them. If for some, uh, you know, unforeseeable reason, uh, we couldn't get fuel out to the island, they could provide us fuel and then we could help distribute from there. Yeah. Um, a couple other proofs. Uh, we have a single point mooring uh, where the crude is actually uh, deposited for, for the refineries. We, we have a, a mooring that floats out about a little less than two miles off the coast uh, and a crude ship will come in, we'll, we'll connect it uh, and hold it in position with some tugboats and then we'll receive the, uh, the crude load from the ship. Um, one of the other proofs of concept we did was with um, the uh, Navy, or excuse me, the Sealift Command vessel uh, a couple of years ago, the MT Empire State uh, and we wanted to see if it would be possible to bring a sea lift command or a Navy ship and connect it to our mooring. Uh, again, for that same concept, could they receive fuel from us or could they deposit uh, fuel into that and utilize our, our systems and pipelines? So, uh, you know, in conjunction with the military, we try to uh, come up with different ideas, other opportunities for, for future development, not just to continue to support the military, but to support the entire Hawaiian economy. Yeah, that's really interesting that you might you might have special reserves to get back from the military and then distribute them in times of crisis to the community. That's something. Absolutely. You know, I mean, out here in Hawaii, we're, we're so remote. It's, it's, we're in our, our own holistic uh, support bubble, if you will, taking yeah. care of not just military, but civilian needs as well. Yeah, have to work together. So what about renewables? Uh, you know, I know that uh, PAR was uh, trying to be flexible about the development of renewables. Uh, mostly what you do is fossil fuel, I guess, but query, uh, have you done anything or you plan to do anything on renewables? Uh, you know, absolutely. As a, you know, an energy company, particularly out here in the Pacific where, you know, that is our, you know, this is our land. This is, uh, we, we all need to take care of it. Um, as a company, we want to grow and adapt with that as well. And, you know, we are uh, seeking out different avenues and opportunities. Uh, some of those with, um, you know, biodiesels and things like that. Um, you know, I don't have specifics on, on all the programs we're doing, but we have engaged in, in multiple uh, avenues to pursue those. So what do you see the future for PAR? I mean, it, it, through COVID, I guess it's affected you in terms of sales to the, at least the local community. And, and then of course you get to the underside of the tunnel and you look for the light, it's out there somewhere. There is a better time coming, hopefully soon. Uh, what is it going to be for PAR at that time? What is it going to be for the, you know, consumption of fuel here in Hawaii, both by the civilian community and by the military? Do you have a, a view of that? I mean, you know, our, our view is certainly to be the, uh, you know, enduring source of, of energy for the Hawaiian islands, uh, you know, in the future and continuing and onward. And with the, uh, the way the future is going, we all need to be flexible and adapt. And I can certainly... Uh, you know, see where we're going to continue to incorporate more uh, of those renewable resources and uh, different avenues of energy uh, within to our, you know, into our company portfolio moving forward. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, part, part stance is we're definitely going to continue to be that powerhouse for the future for Hawaii. Huh. Somebody asked a question that's exactly identical to a question that, um, you know, that I was going to ask. Um, could you ask how the apprenticeship program uh, with HCC is going. Is that, is that you, Captain? Uh, that is me. Apprentice, yeah, what, what, is, what is that about? What is the program about and what, is, what are you doing with HCC on that? Oh, we have a great apprenticeship program. Uh, it's, uh, we're in the hundredth year of our apprenticeship program. Um, we've, uh, we've graduated about 5,600 apprentices through uh, since its inception. Um, 
the 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 apprentice gets a uh, an associate's degree uh, with Honolulu Community College um, after their four year apprenticeship um, as they learn a trade and and become um, you know mechanics at the end of that apprenticeship. Um, there's we teach 22 trades across 27 shops and nine codes. Um, it's it's really the life force uh, that injects into our shipyard talent pool uh, that makes up that skilled uh, labor. Uh, we've got a great relationship with our union, and uh, we take care of those uh, those apprentices. Uh, they're really our lifeblood. Um, but the the key the key trades really are are your machinists, uh, marine machinery mechanics, um, pipe fitters, electricians. Uh, and ship fitters are the the key trades there, but uh, it's been going on for about a hundred years. Um, it's going to continue. Uh, we certainly get a lot of applicants, uh, folks uh, that want to come in and and participate in our apprenticeship program. Is there, is there room for Mark in that program? And and uh, if not, is there room for me? I, I um, need a little training in that. Yeah, we'll have to really scrutinize your resumes, but um, yeah. <laughs> Well, we're out of time, you guys. Uh, Mark, let me ask you to uh, you know, tell, tell our viewers what you would like to leave with them about PAR. What may they not know about? What should they know about? Uh, how does PAR um, affect, integrate with the local economy? Why should they appreciate that, that connection? Um, you know, really, PAR is a, it's a family organization and we, we are here as part of the Hawaiian Ohana. And, uh, you know, we, we truly support the entire uh, Hawaiian island chain. And, you know, we, we pride ourselves on being the, the sole, uh, you know, provider of energy to the Hawaiian islands, whether it's for uh, Tahiko for, to create electricity for all of us or to the gas station uh, to power our vehicles, um, you know, that, that's why we exist. We're here to, to support the community and to take care of, uh, take care of the Ohana. Thank you, Mark. Um, Captain, you know, uh, back in the 60s, uh, I tried cases, both council, uh, trial council and defense council in the 14th Naval District. The Coast Guard put me on loan to the 14th Naval District. Some of the guys that I tried cases against in, in that context went on to be Navy admirals, as a matter of fact. A long time ago, but <clears throat> so I have a soft spot for the Navy in the 14th uh, Naval District, um, and I wonder if you could, you know, leave your uh, takeaway with our viewers on what it all means uh, in its connection, in its connection with Hawaii historically, and its connection economically right now. Uh, sure, um, we've we've talked about a lot of things, but most of that was, you know, backward looking and and current uh, economic impact. But um, as we look forward, uh, this shipyard is, is going to maintain, is going to stay a crown jewel uh, right here in the Pacific uh, with the type of mission that we have right now of delivering those ships that are fit to fight back to the fleet. Um, and as we look forward, uh, the Navy has agreed uh, across the shipyards um, to optimize the shipyards. And that, that the Navy is assessing uh, building a new dry dock here uh, in the shipyard. Um, uh, among other things with, um, you know, a waterfront production facility that would optimize our operations in the shipyard. Uh, the overall plan is about $21 billion across the shipyards. Um, and we would expect to get about 5 billion of that dollar, 5 billion of that right here in Pearl Harbor. So our mission is going to continue to, to move forward. Uh, the, the, we have great support from, uh, from the Navy. Uh, to continue to support the shipyard here right in the middle of the Pacific in this uh, extremely strategic location uh, that's going to support families here on the island uh, for many generations to come. So um, appreciate you having me on the show today, Jay. Yeah, well, both you guys have a, you're part of the, uh, the, you know, the central nervous system, the supply system, uh, the economy, if you will, of the state of Hawaii. Uh, so I think people have to see you in that context. You're a, an essential element in our economy. Thank you, Captain Greg Burton. Thank you, Mark Twilliger. Really appreciate you coming down. Thanks for Thanks having me for on. Thanks for having us. Aloha.